Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much. I know, I thought so too. I know. And she wrote back and she gave us this. Let's see how well I can project. See if you can make us shut up. If I can. Well, this is the flight of Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 The Academic Web Technologies team and OIT, we're also known as the EEE team. We build, maintain, and support the whole suite of EEE tools, including most recently Canvas. Uh, so thank you all for coming today. I'm going to be very brief and hand over to Karen, but I'll be present to answer any questions that may come up later that uh, come my way. And you're also welcome to catch up with me after the fact if you've got some questions that you want to send to me. So without further ado, Karen and our wonderful panelists, let's hand things over. Thank you very much. So my name is Karen. I'm the Senior Instructional Technology Specialist in the Office of Information Technology. And it is my pleasure to work with instructors such as these and some of you in the audience to get your course bases configured and help in the transition between the two systems. What I'd like to start with is a little bit of a background on the transition and give you a little bit of an update as far as where we are and where we're going. So to start with, it's always fun when the remote doesn't work correctly. <laughs> All right, so what exactly is this transition thing that we are talking about here? Um, the vision for the transition is to start from the suite of legacy tools that we currently have in EEE right now, our homegrown system, and to transition that into a more dynamic ecosystem with EEE plus Canvas at the center. And what that means in practical terms is that we're going to be providing new homegrown tools that will provide the functionality that our campus needs and that is custom tailored, designed to UCI. And it also means that we'll be incorporating other external tools as well because one of the things that is exciting about Canvas is it does give us that capability to take in external tools and connect them into our system. So this is kind of the vision for where we are going in the long term. It is gonna take a number of years for us to get from where we are now to where we're going. Because as you can imagine, EEE is a complex system. There's a lot of moving parts. So your academic web technologies team and your OIT team is making sure that we're doing this in a careful way so that we're making sure that all of our I's are dotted and T's are crossed. So these are some numbers for you just to kind of give you a feel for how the, the transition is happening. We start here with the invitation only pilot. So you can see we had 20% of students at UCI and 6% of instructors in the Canvas course base in that first term. We then went into a summer session, which is a little bit different because we have instructional designers that help instructors pull together their course bases, and there are a number of online courses as well. And then we moved into an open campus pilot. And you can see at that point we were at about 11, 12% of instructors and about 43, 42% of students in at least one Canvas course base. At the end of the campus pilot, the campus decided that we were gonna move forward with the full transition. So what that meant is now, this is the beginning of the transition. So you can see, there's a big change here in fall. <laughs> right, so we jumped from about the 47% adoption of students to about the 70%. So currently in the spring term, 72% of all students here at UCI are enrolled in at least one EE plus Canvas course base. And 24% of instructors are associated with those course bases. Yeah. Do you have any sense of how many unique faculty members have used Canvas at this point? What percentage? That is a great question that I don't have off the top of my head, okay. but we can definitely follow up with you and get you more information yeah. on that. Because, I mean, presumably it's bigger than 25%, but the question is sort of how much more. It is. And what we're seeing is um, so each term is an opportunity for instructors who teach maybe once a year to try out the system afresh. So um, each term we have folks who have been in it for a while, and we have some folks that are new. So. It's a good question that we'll, we'll follow up with and get you some more information. So you might be wondering about how does EEE legacy use compared to EE plus Canvas use? So this just gives you a feel for how things are adjusting. Again, you see kind of a, a big moment here in fall where we switched and there were more courses in Canvas than there were in EEE legacy. What we are using to say a course is in EE legacy for this particular graph is a course website. Throughout the pilot and all the transition, OIT has continued to focus our support efforts to make sure that UCI has the resources that you guys need. So we've got a really well-trained support team 
that is able to answer questions as you guys send us emails or give us phone calls. Um, we've worked extensively with Instructure to make sure that the things that are confusing or maybe could be better are documented for Instructure, the company that provides Canvas as well. Um, you can see there's a lot of bars here, but you can see the trend is upward. <sighs> okay, so as our campus continues to move through this transition, the support requests are just increasing because it's a new system, right? New instructors are playing with the tools and they're trying to figure out how the system works. Definitely recommend if you guys have questions as you're using Canvas or if you have questions, you're thinking about using Canvas maybe around the fence and you've got, you just want to know if it can do something for you, let us know. You're always welcome to send us an email or give us a phone call and we're more than happy to help. One of the things that you'll find in this new ecosystem is stuff is continually improving. So not only is the OIT team working to update and maintain tools and make our tools better for you, the new <laughs> tools that will be part of the new E plus ecosystem, but Instructure also releases updates as well. So one of the things that you'll find is we frequently post updates on our Canvas transition site, and this tells you what's new. So our team goes through and looks at all the documentation of what's coming out, what's new, what's improved, how things are changing. We, we kind of get a feel for what our campus uses, and we provide in more understandable language <laughs> what those updates actually mean for an instructor. So you might be wondering how you can get more information about this transition. The first is our transition site. So it's just at sites.uci.edu slash canvas. We frequently update this. You can see our panel event is listed on the home page. And um, we also have um, quarterly updates to the number of uh, instructors and students in the system. So this is a great resource for learning more both about Canvas and about where UCI is in the transition. In addition, the EEE homepage gives you some additional information. So you can get at things like the various tools that are available. And you can also get at information about the status of the transition. Throughout the EEE legacy system, in all of our tools, there are informational banners. And those banners, you can see they say, learn more about what's happening. And you can click on this to go to a page that gives you significantly more information about the functionality of the tools, um, what some alternatives are, and where we are in the transition. And finally, I would encourage you all, if you guys have questions about where we are, or if you have ideas about ways that we can communicate with you and your colleagues about what's happening in this transition, what's new and, and where things are going, please do let us know. We are always looking for unique ideas for ways to communicate with you guys and give you guys information about what's happening in this uh, process. And I, I also want to stress that we're not looking for a sugar-coated version of the questions and information. We really genuinely want to know what's going well and what's not going well, and even what's just confusing. Um, there are some things in the system that are an adjustment, absolutely. The functionality is new, the buttons are in different places, and it's very different. So please do let us know the things that you love, the things that you just absolutely can't stand, and the things that you want us to help you improve. <laughs> All right? Another question? Yes. Um, this is going to sound very ignorant, but I'm good at those questions. No. <laughs> What's the relationship of EEE to Canvas? Is EEE the environment and Canvas is a platform? or is So is the main portal EEE? And it's, a, it's just like this entity as opposed to this. Because I think of EEE as the place where I build my class questions. Yes, so it's a great question, not very good question. Um, EEE is a toolbox. It gives you a variety of homegrown tools that we've provided for the campus since about the mid-90s. Canvas has similar functionality to many of those tools on EEE. So for example, when you're creating your course on EEE, you might go and create a quiz, right? You want to assess your students, see how they're doing. Canvas has an equivalent quiz tool, but it's within a Canvas course space. So where we are now is we have the EEE Legacy Toolbox, which is a set of homegrown tools, each of which will be reviewed and looked at going forward. And we also have EEE Plus Canvas, which is designed to be a complete toolbox in its own. So the goal of the transition is to make sure that we give you guys the best of breed for the tools. So in many respects, what that means, and I'm going to go back to the quiz example, because Canvas has a quiz, 
we probably don't need to build and maintain a separate quiz on the EEE legacy system. So going forward, we will be evaluating those two and likely retiring one tool so that instructors can use just the best of a breed tool. That kind of makes sense? Yeah, it did. as a metaphor, it, it's not that there's one door and you go in and you, you can find Canvas within the EEE door. You have to, there's actually two doors. There's, there's an actually an two doors. Door yes. That's a great metaphor. I'll add to it just briefly. Right now, it's just, these systems are essentially running in parallel and they're two distinct systems but you can use them in any combined way that you might like to use. So you might use some tools in one, some in another. There's no restriction preventing you from doing that. Ultimately, we'll be building a new single door that you can go through to get to all of the tools that we provide, whether they're through Canvas or whether they're homegrown or third-party tools. So we're not there yet. This transition is going to take us several years. So right now, you've got two doors. Uh, before too much longer, you'll have one door, and it'll take you through a wide assortment of things, just a much bigger room behind that door. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, I understand the AAA survey tool is going to be going away. If we have already created surveys in um, AAA, is there going to be a way that we can take all that and not have to redo the whole thing? Very good question. We are in the very early stages of looking at the retirement for the tools in AAA Legacy. One of the significant things that we are looking at when we look at all of our tools is what happens to the data that's in the system right now. So while I can't tell you for sure where that data is going to go, I can tell you that it is absolutely one of the considerations that we have in mind and that we will be documenting and that we will be keeping that as a, a significant um, criteria when we look at alternative tools. Yeah, I have a question for, um, because I'm using, currently I'm using the Canvas and I use the link, a lot of the materials from the EE base. I was wondering, is there any day all the materials on the EE will be Yes, yeah, so the, the question of dates is actually a challenging question, and let me explain why. So because EEE is more of a toolbox, because it is a bunch of different tools, our team has to go through each one of those tools individually and take a look at what's in the tool and how are we going to move forward from that tool. So unfortunately at this point we don't have a drop dead date where the stuff on Tripoli e disappears on Tripoli e Legacy and it, it is all in EEE plus Canvas. But that's why I would encourage you to keep track of things like the announcements within the tool. Because within those announcements, you will start to see things trying to get your attention, <laughs> telling you things are going to be changing. Anytime we make an announcement about a change of something that will be retired on EEE, the first announcement is going to be a year in advance. And what that announcement tells you is that a year from now, the tool will become read only. So it won't be that your data will necessarily disappear in that time span but it will mean that the system will change and the way that you interact with it will change. So I would encourage you to watch for ZOP mails and communication from us and in tool documentation as well. Any other questions? Perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our first instructor, to Angela. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you for the, the invitation to be here. Uh, I am Angela Jenks. Um, I'm in the Department of Anthropology. Um, I started using Canvas about two years ago. Um, I can show some of the, the way I made this transition and how I have, have started to use it. Um, I essentially started using Canvas because I thought I would be forced to. Um, <laughs> that was my only motivation. Canvas is my fifth course management system in the last several years. Um, I had learned Blackboard while I was doing some adjunct teaching in graduate school. I started my, my first full-time job was at a community college where we learned Moodle, and then a year after I arrived, the tr campus transitioned to uh, Etudes. So I learned that one. A year or two after that, I came here to UCI, I learned Triple E, and then right after I got here, I learned that we were transitioning to Canvas. <laughs> so I started transitioning to Canvas. I have done this, this transition before. Um, but in general, I am not somebody who is an early adopter of technology. I don't find it especially fun to learn something new. Um, I want to, I don't want to beta test things and see how they're working and give feedback and things like that. Um, once it works, and if it works better than what I have already been using, I am happy to adopt it. Um, so I'm not necessarily someone who's excited to try <laughs> new things. Um, my first Triple E course, or my first Canvas, Triple E Canvas course was in a graduate seminar. Um, it was a small class, um, so while I was learning the tool, I thought it was best to work with graduate students, who I also thought would be a little more forgiving of my inability to fully use the tool. Um, I've also found that, although Triple E support has excellent tech support, um, in a lot of my undergrad classes, I am the first line 
of tech support for a lot of students, and I was not comfortable doing that for something that I wasn't sure how to use. So I began in a graduate seminar. Um, since then, I've done four different courses, five, five different courses um, in Canvas, both graduate and undergraduate, up to about 400 students has been the biggest one. Um, this is just what the dashboard of Canvas looks like. This is what mine currently looks like. The class I'm teaching this spring, the two from winter that I've still got up there. If you go to, if you're still new to it, if you go to courses here, you can see all the ones you've ever taught. Um, you see this spring, I learned how to put a picture up there. <laughs> so each, each one gets a little better. Um, the beginning, this first graduate seminar, it was a very text-based page. Each week had its own page within Canvas. I hadn't quite figured out what modules were yet, so I didn't, didn't use them. Um, essentially, students were doing a lot of reading. They would write a reading reflection that I had them post in the discussion section. We would come into class and then talk about the readings. It's a, this is a kind of social science grad seminar, the way they tend to, to run. Um, I also was using also the, the ability in Canvas to have everybody in the class edit pages. Um, I used that to create a wiki style, what I called keywords. Um, and I can show you an example of what that looked like. You can see this was the home page. It's all text. Um, I was having trouble navigating at the beginning, so this navigation was for the students who I thought might also feel that way, like to get to the readings, click here. To get to the post your responses, click here. To contribute to the keywords, click here. Um, so I just put that on the front page for them. For most of these students, this was also the first time they had ever seen Canvas. The pages kind of look like this. If you went to the page, there's week one, week two, week three. Um, this was basically mirroring how I had been using Tripoli. Um, so in Tripoli, I would, had, would create these weekly tabs where each, under each week you could see, read this, turn this in, here are the assignments, here's any materials, course slides, handouts, anything I had, videos I had shown, anything that had happened in class. So you know what, this is a, it's not clickable. It's a picture. Um, it is, <laughs> it's a picture. Um, did I post? Oh, this is what like week seven would look like in Canvas um, in this first class. So here are the required readings. There's the links to them, um, other recommended resources, readings for, for the grad students. Um, so it was all basically lots of texts, lists of things, but we, we found everything. Um, I used the discussion board to have students post reading reflections, and then hopefully the idea was that they would read those reflections before they came into the, the seminar to discuss. Uh, this was the, the keywords that we used. So this is a page in Canvas where I set it so that I and all of the students could collectively edit it. Um, and the idea was this was our, our foundational, um, I direct the, the master's program in medicine, science, and technology studies. And this was the pro seminar. It's the required course for the MSTS program. Um, so students were working on developing keywords in medicine, science, and technology studies. So here they are discussing after network theory. And the idea was that they could identify key terms, theories, ideas, um, and they could continue to edit each of these terms and their discussions of them uh, throughout the, the quarter. So how they understood after network theory week two would be very different than how they understood it week seven, and we could go back and collectively create um, this document. Um, and that was a really... I think that's something that wouldn't have been possible in Tripoli to have all of the students and I in the class um, collectively working on the same document within the, the course space. So that was my very first experience. Um, as I moved on the following quarter, the next time, um, I started trying to, I started discovering more of the tools that Tripoli had, <coughs> trying to use them to achieve certain things I wanted to do in the class. Um, for example, each week, especially in grad classes, but in the, the undergrad too, students always had reading they would have to do, um, often some sort of response, some sort of engagement with the reading, something they would have to respond to in some way, um, asking them to share that with others, either post it in the discussion board or some other form, um, and then having other resources available for students. Um, so I learned, with Adrian's help, about modules, um, which was great, um, and discovered that I could actually organize rather than just having one page that listed a bunch of things, organize a variety of different resources into what Canvas calls modules. Um, and could use, a, I'll show you an example of what that looks like. So this would be a week two module, where now it can tell the students you want to, this is also from the same graduate course, but the next year that I taught it, read this 
read Merton, read Fleck. Um, they had to read and annotate one piece of work, click on the recommended resources here. Um, here's the slides that the discussion leaders, the student discussion leaders had used in class, I could post afterwards. Um, so it became more of a running to-do list for students. Um, and that I found works very well. It works well in the graduate classes, but especially in the undergrad classes, um, where it says, read this, comment here, turn this in, take this quiz, do this, um, and then the next week, what they have to do. I learned to use some of the visual elements. Um, so this is the front page of my undergraduate 400-person uh, medical anthropology class um, with an image up here, information about the class, and I and the TAs. Um, and then on the front page, I had images and each of the images linked to the part of the module for that week. So what we would be doing that week, they could go and see week one, you have to do these activities. Um, it also gave kind of a, there was one more line that didn't fit here for the rest of the quarter, um, but it also gave a kind of visual um, just view of what we would be doing each week and how we would be moving throughout the, the quarter from one topic to the next. This is another example of an undergrad class. I moved away from, after the first time of doing this, um, I, th I think not a lot of students actually had bookmarked the front page. They actually bookmarked the module, so they didn't see this page all that often. Um, but for when they did, I had, again, some images representing the class, a link to the syllabus, and a kind of, this is the front page of the syllabus, so they could see what it looked like and then blew it up. Um, and then this linked into the, the modules. Um, again, for, what year was this? Well, this was just this last winter. Um, but I still encounter um, students regularly who have never worked in Canvas before. Um, and so for them, it is not necessarily intuitive where everything is. And so this gave them on the front page, here's where you find everything you need to know, a list of everything that's happening. And that goes straight to the, the modules. Angela? Yes. So you have this link here, download the syllabus. Yes. Is that a separate document that you created, or is that something? Yeah, it's a PDF. Yeah. Um, I have not used the syllabus tool in here, though I think Joel has, so you will see okay. an example of that in a minute. Um, so yes, it was a separate external PDF that they could download. Um, I also started, so in Canvas you can also embed, um, this is for I think a discussion of uh, the body. <laughs> um, so but you can embed videos that, these were videos that I had actually shown in class, so short video clips that I had shown in class. Um, that then I posted afterwards for students. Um, oftentimes, especially with YouTube, many of those can be embedded into the page itself, um, which also can create a kind of more dynamic um, page. Uh, I started using the discussion sections in a couple different ways, um, and there are benefits and drawbacks, I think, to the Canvas discussion. Um, on the one hand, you can't create forums and then have threads, discussion threads underneath it, as you can in Tripoli, um, and which I really like being able to do. So I could have a question forum, and then if there's homework they're doing in there, the homework forum, and then a something else forum, and we can't really do that this way. Um, so there's just one this question thread that would come in, um, but I started using the, um, the discussions for blog posts for students. So this is an example of where students had to find an example of, this is a class on race, gender, and science that I teach. They had to find some pop culture example of something that highlighted issues of science in relation to race and gender that we were talking about, post it, discuss it. Um, they could then, I think these students are discussing um, Asian eyelid surgery, which we had talked about in class, um, and racialized cosmetic surgeries in general. Um, and they could post it here and then discuss it, give feedback to each other. Um, one of the downsides is that if you see there's, I created a different blog, one thread for each discussion section, so no student had to read 400 other students' posts, they just had to read those in their discussion sections. Um, they had to do four of the blogs, so here's blog four for discussion two, discussion eight, discussion four, discussion six, discussion three. I don't know if there's a more elegant way <laughs> to do that, um, but for me it meant that there, there's an enormous number of these assignments I had to create and they can't be copied and pasted over and just reassigned to, it's exactly the same assignment, just assigned to a different group. They had to be independently created and then my discussion board was basically full of just these blogs and occasionally it made it so that I would miss 
other important things students were asking. So there were benefits and drawbacks, I think, to that tool. So the, the, this is like central to the online courses I teach? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does the Canvas supply the tracking uh, information yes. about what students are writing, how many words they're writing, yes. when they wrote, and all that? Yes, I don't know about word count. I haven't looked for that, um, but they, they definitely, so I could go in and see students had to do three of the four blog posts. Um, and I could click on the students themselves and see how many posts they had done, how many replies they had done to others. So the discussions certainly do not provide word counts. So that is one thing that is to um, One of the things that you can do, particularly for online courses, you can call a discussion a graded discussion, and that gives you some additional tools that you can use to come up with the students' work is. So it, is, it has similar functionality, but there are, for example, set of classes and minuses between the two Well, the word count was useful as a flag. You know, 600, right. 632, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, The gradebook um, has a number of tools that were very useful, that I found very useful. Um, you can do a number of weighted. You can do different kinds of weights. I tend to do my classes by point values, um, but I do a lot of dropping of scores. Um, so if there are 10 discussion sections throughout the quarter, students have to attend six discussions. Um, there were four blog posts assigned, they had to do three. And I have a whole variety of reasons I do that one. But the main one is that I don't feel like I can be responsible for being the arbiter of other people's emergencies and life decisions. We all have life happen, so that can happen to you three times for discussion <laughs> sections. And it's okay, everybody gets sick, but I also I don't accept late work and I don't yeah, it also makes it easier to get, to avoid kind of what's a valid excuse versus what's not. Everybody gets a life happens pass. <laughs> um, so I'm very often dropping scores in different sections. So you can set up, this is actually the ungraded section, but I could set up the discussion sections and keep, you know, the six highest scores there. And then the quizzes, which I'll have and drop one of the lowest scores there. And the blog posts and drop one score. Um, so you can set that up in a number of different categories, which was very helpful. On the downside, actually one of the downsides you see here is that it's difficult to embed things. Um, so in this particular class, you had asked a question about why I dropped the highest score. This is the ungraded category. In this class, we had, I think there were nine discussion sections. They had to attend six. They were all held in person except week eight. Um, and week eight, I and the TAs were all traveling to the National Anthropology Conference. None of us were there. We did online discussions, but we did four options. So students could choose one of those prompts to respond to and get credit for their weekly discussion. So I had to drop three of those because they only get credit for one, but then that would count within their week eight, which was part of where they were also dropping several. And that became very complicated. So essentially what I ended up doing was transferring by hand all of the grades from here and then eliminating this score. But if I deleted it, it would delete the whole thread, which I didn't want to do. It's, that may not make sense. But it was a very complicated day before grades were due workaround that nothing was calculating <laughs> correctly. Um, and it was because you couldn't drop things. Options within options mm -hmm. was not an mm -hmm. option. Um, but there are, there are workarounds for things, which also can be very useful. So I have encountered, especially in the grade book, is probably the place where I've encountered the most frustration um, and also found ways to work around it. This was also true with something like for the discussion sections, the point value they had. It turns out that once I dropped the scores, the number of points they would have was something like added up to 79.08 out of the 80 points they were supposed to have which also was difficult to adjust. Um, basically, I just added another assignment category where everybody got 0 .02 <laughs> points to adjust for that. Um, because I started getting emails that the syllabus says the class is out of 400 points, but my canvas says mine is only out of 399.98 points. What happened? Um, so I fixed that, that way. Um, there are a lot of options within your assignments, um, but sometimes they can be hard to find. So searching around for them is, I think, one of the other big things I've learned. The last thing um, I've learned is 
about working with external tools um, and some of the variability in Canvas systems places. Um, two particular tools I've used, this is Hypothesis, um, which is an annotation, collective annotation software. Um, so this is a reading we were doing and the students are responding here. The highlighted sections are things they've commented on. They can reply to each other's comments. We were collectively commenting on reading together this piece. Um, Hypothesis says that they integrate with Canvas. And I spent a very long time trying to figure out why I couldn't get it to integrate with Canvas. Um, similarly for Poll Everywhere, um, which I used instead of clickers in a class, this is its responsive classroom software. So I asked students what questions they have. They can respond from any cell phone device, computer, anything that they have. Um, what I like about it is that they can upvote things. So the list that runs here, they can vote for things that they want to move to the top of the, the list. Um, Poll Everywhere also says that they can integrate with the gradebook in Canvas. So I was using this as a kind of attendance, the way one would use clickers. Um, I also spent a really long time trying to figure out why that wasn't true. Um, and what I have learned is that there are different customizations of Canvas on different campuses. <coughs> um, this has also come out where I've tried to Google answers to things I'm having trouble with um, before I bug the team because of how much it annoys me occasionally when students send me emails about things they could have just looked up. It's like, I'm going to look it up and I find all this, these responses about, yes, do this, this, and this to integrate with Canvas, but none of that is actually true. Um, so my other good advice um, is to really make use of the, the Tripoli and Canvas team here who have been extremely helpful. Every time I have a question, they send back very detailed, excellent responses. Um, but it's not always that you can talk to someone who's using Canvas on a different campus and get information that actually will apply here. Um, there are different versions of the, the programs and different customizations. I will hand it over. Thank you. Joel, some other experience. Hi, I'm Joel Beanstra. I'm in the drama department at the Claire Trevor School of the Arts. Uh, I've, I'm traditionally an early adopter, so I was on the initial pilot uh, uh, exploration of Canvas, and I was excited to try it out and kind of uh, explore it. When I first got to UCI, I was very excited to integrate uh, EEEE into my classes and utilize them in that way, so I was excited to see what this new uh, application would do. Uh, there we go. Uh, so that was my motivation, is kind of uh, seeing how this new tool would help me. I find that learning management systems really help me uh, create a nice base and arc to my class and making sure that I hit the points that I want to hit, and if I get off track, how to readjust to that uh, adjustment. Uh, I appreciate, uh, when I first started this, I started with a smaller graduate student class uh, of state graduate stage managers, and uh, I made bold efforts to frame it as we're going to be beta testing this, this is going to be an experience that may go wrong, don't stress, if you have any questions or concerns, let me know, and we will solve it together, and that will be fine. Uh, end of the quarter came, and they universally said, we hate Canvas. <laughs> so uh, what I learned from that as continuing to progress through utilizing Canvas in the future is a couple things. One is you want to uh, make sure that you uh, know how the features work. Right, or know kind of what features are available for you, uh, because uh, my lack of experience sometimes didn't set things up well, and so then there's frustrations and, and challenges with it. Secondarily, uh, you want to make sure that your classroom core space is set up in a, in a very strong way in the beginning. The more robust your class is, the more you've taught it, the easier it is to do that to transfer your content into a learning management system, so then the elements are there and it's easily, easily utilized. Uh, in addition, the, the third element of it is trying to keep, make sure that you keep up to date on that. Sometimes uh, within the School of the Arts, we have a lot of things going on, uh, and so sometimes the, uh, we get behind on things, and certainly uh, certain elements get lagged behind, and certain readings may not get posted, and then people get anxious, and then you post it, and they get less anxious. Uh, but the more you can kind of set up in advance, make sure things are ready to go, and then keep on top of it throughout the quarter is very effective. I, uh, since that first course, uh, the majority of my students really appreciate Canvas. I've set up seven different courses in Triple E plus Canvas, both undergraduate and graduate. Uh, I've done it in my discipline. I technically teach kind of in three core areas, uh, inter improvisation, collaborative production, and stage management. I've also used it for a university studies three freshman seminar, and I've been appreciated for that as well. Uh, I've had classes up to 100 and as small as nine, uh, so quite a big uh, range of 
options. The, uh, this is kind of the initial landing space for us as we look at that space. Uh, this is where we're at right now in terms of my uh, course space. Uh, I use, uh, whenever I set up a Canvas site, I always start with a calendar, uh, which then populates my syllabus. Uh, within the School of the Arts, we have over 200 different events that are happening, and our production stage managers that I uh, mentor and guide uh, facilitate helping to stage manage dance and drama productions throughout the quarter. And so we live and die by the calendar. So initially, we have a calendar system in there. And if you click on the calendar link, you have this. And you can set up your calendar and put in the different classes that you have. We utilize a thing called that within my theatrical world we call show codes, which are essentially just shorter versions of content so you can identify things quickly. So within each of these days, I've got a W3C5 for week three, class five, just as a quick identifier uh, for where we're at and then kind of what the content is for that day that just breaks it down. I always start, whenever I'm starting, uh, setting up one of these spaces is filling in all of these elements first so that I know kind of what the scope of my class over one quarter looks like. I also integrate uh, the different uh, assignments that are in here, as well as other small notes that may be uh, important for them at any given time. Notice that all of these assignments have cross-throughs uh, because it's a dynamic setting. So as your calendar progresses throughout time, your, your assignments will close off and it'll denote where you're at within the nature of your course. This is what the calendar looks like in the syllabus page. So when you click on syllabus, and you put in those dates on your calendar, all of that will populate into a list format so you can see what the different week three, class four, what the assignment is, and that auto-populates into your syllabus so suddenly you have not only a calendar version but also a breakdown list version for where we're at in the quarter. Uh, we also, I love that, the feature that I love most about Canvas though is then that calendar that you create can then be uh, exported and subscribed to by both myself and my students so that they get all of the calendar dates in their Outlook or in their iCal or in their Google Calendar so that they have automatically their class dates in there as well as their assignments. Reminders can come up for them and I make sure that I include the instructions for that as well in all my classes so that they know how to utilize that and engage that so that they can just keep up to date. It's also helpful again as you keep uh, as there might be changes within the quarter, as you make a change, it automatically then updates in the Canvas space and then automatically updates on their calendars personally. And so as a class may be dynamic or content takes a little bit longer on a day, you can give and take to make those adjustments in a very dynamic uh, way and engage that. I also utilize uh, putting a visual on my homepage or landing page. Uh, this is uh, created from essentially just a template within Apple's pages. Uh, there's different template packs you can pack, but I find that students, to get the content more in a slightly more engaging fashion than just text, I put a few little graphic images on that highlight what the elements are, and then highlight how to get to the Canvas space. And this has kind of just the key elements of the class in terms of on the back side of this document that I'd print out for them, it would just have a, a very simple calendar. On the front side, we have course objectives, course text, how to get in touch with me as simple as possible so that they can go to Canvas to get more of the extra details and more uh, content in terms of what we're covering. But I, again, I make it a visual uh, front page that also then aligns with the hard copy that I handed out so we have a, a visual recognition between the two things. Uh, in terms of the syllabus page itself, it essentially is like any page. There's, just, there's kind of a what you see, what you get uh, website page. Uh, that you can create like a Word document and you can insert links so that folks can go deeper into the world of the class. And then if you scroll down, I just make sure that all this content is the same content that's on my hard copy document, but here I put with links as well. And then at the bottom of this page, if you scroll up, you get that calendar, that list calendar in terms of where you're at within the syllabus of the quarter. Again, I think it's incredible because it's dynamic. It updates so that wherever you're at in the quarter, the, the, the page is highlighted of this is our content today, which I'm, I'm managing two new children under five and uh, multiple productions and multiple classes as a, uh, as a lecture track faculty member. Uh, so I have a lot to manage, and so having this is a nice reminder in terms of what's going on, sort of keeping track and keeping up to date with what's happening. Additional techniques that I've acquired and barriers that I've experienced. Uh, the this is another uh, page that I created uh, that's essentially the syllabus, but I've cut it in half and I just have the 
the image there because sometimes I'm not ready with myself. So let's just be honest. Sometimes I'm not ready till the actual day class starts. And so I put just a landing page with the graphic that's going to be on the syllabus so folks recognize that if they're anxious and want to get into the website before my class is ready to start. And then I make sure that I have the content ready to be published once the class starts. Uh, but that's a version of a landing page. I want to make sure that I'm welcoming the class. Within the arts, we're a little bit touchy-feely, so we want to make sure people are feeling warm and comfortable in terms of the face, so I make sure that the contents there is kind of a welcoming environment, and I phrase it again that we are trying things out, and this is new technology, and this might be new technology for you, so uh, if you have questions, ask. Uh, here's again another example of a visual a syllabus. Again, just a page from a template. Uh, both of my colleagues here said, we recognize that template. We've used that before. <laughs> so it's an exciting thing to denote, oh, wow, we're doing similar things in the, across the school uh, in some exciting ways. So, And I tend to break down grades in terms of uh, percentages to, to equal 100, because I find that as an easier pathway. And I'll talk about weighted grading in just a moment. Uh, later on, after my initial round, my initial round I just essentially set up my web page, set up the syllabus page, and uh, was very basic. I've done things like breaking out the modules, and I, I break them up. This is essentially week zero, because at this week I was actually going to a, a conference in Montreal, and so I wasn't able to be there for, for the first class in person, but I wanted to have the content delivered not just by the person that was covering the class, but by kind of the framing that I wanted to have, so I created this frame out of these are the things that are going to be covered within the class, first class. And so if you want to get ahead of that, you can do that. And I made sure that they read it by putting a magic word within the content uh, that was somewhat difficult for some people to find, but it's pretty basic. It said literally, PS, the magic word is please, or something to that effect. <laughs> and if you read through all the content, then you could find that. I've also found it really helpful to utilize this going forward, because once I implemented this, I found that I could save almost an entire class period by saying, all right, here are the key things you want to be aware of. Go review this document. We'll touch base next class in terms of any questions you have. So it was a huge time saver for us, whereas it typically the class, especially this as a 100-person class, which seems small for probably some departments, but for the School of the Arts, that's a huge class. We rarely have that many uh, people within a class setting. Uh, it was a huge time saver. Uh, I also have utilized discussions in Tripoli uh, plus Canvas. The discussions are great for distributing information, allowing students to talk to each other. Uh, historically, I've really appreciated Facebook uh, as creating a private page, and I create a link through that for a private Facebook page, so it's not a public thing, it's just for the class to engage with. I found the majority of students have that as a great way to create discussions in a dynamic way, and also uh, I love their formatting in terms of having links that come live and it becomes interesting for a student to click on. Not all students have uh, Facebook, and within Facebook, as I'm counting up how many few times people have posted, because that's a requirement of the course, we don't have, like within Triple E, the ability to count like automatically. So I'm literally at the end of the quarter, either I or TA, I'm going through and counting each post. Uh, we, the students that don't have Facebook, I encourage them not to get Facebook because it's, a, it's like a drug. Uh, so uh, I encourage them to just use Canvas and then they do their assignment within that framework. And that's a fine option. Uh, but it's, uh, it's just not a, as currently as uh, visually interesting in terms of when they post a link, it doesn't automatically populate with the image or the content from the link. Uh, this is a student that's asking me about finding the, uh, the magic word and some other information. I can a answer that question and as a discussion it allows other people to be aware of kind of what we're talking about or kind of what the thoughts are happening within the class. Also, if people ask things on the Facebook group or they're trying to organize things, we integrate in that way as well. Uh, this is a, uh, a one of the posts that they would do similar to what would be on the Facebook post. Note that they're saying a comment about what their content is within the, the link that they're sharing and then there is the link. I would prefer if it auto-populated, but that may come down the line or it may not. Uh, but at least it gives some framework of uh, the link that other folks can find on and then comment on. Uh, in terms of what that experience is. I've also used uh, quizzes both to collect information early on in the term to kind of get a framework of where the students are at or how they feel about technology or depending on what the topic is, we'll uh, explore that in some range so I kind of have some feedback from the students so I know where we're coming in on the process. Uh, one of the th cool things about uh, the transition is that triple E quizzes can transfer into uh, Canvas. Uh, fairly seamlessly. Uh, I had a little bit of a hiccup, but I, we have a great team here of support, so I was able to integrate within the course all those quizzes. Uh, in addition, within Triple E, I 
we, when I use that, you also often have to export the data and then re-import into Gradebook. Within Tripoli, it's all automatic. So when I have the quizzes that I have on a weekly basis with my 100-person class, they complete it and then it's automatically updated in the, in the Gradebook, pending I don't have any text-based answers. If I'm just doing multiple choices or true and false, it's automatically graded, which is a huge time saver with that many students. Uh, here's another uh, piece of information. Note that they can give you some information about kind of who cor answered correctly within the quiz. You can have a feedback quickly in terms of if folks are getting the content or if they're not getting the content. Uh, in terms of the grading setup and weights, I find that I like to have smaller uh, elements of what I'm grading on and then I can put in different assignments within that framework. So breaking it out in terms of weighted sections seems to be very helpful because I don't want to give too much weight to uh, one particular area. Likewise, I'm in the arts, so math and organizing that is not my strongest suit. Uh, but I have had students ask me about the framing of it. And we, you can break it down mathematically, but it's nice to have a system that almost automatically does it for you, uh, which is very convenient and helpful. In addition, I utilize uh, Canvas for doing attendance in my smaller classes. Uh, in my larger classes, I have to do a sign-in sheet because I do want to emphasize within the arts that we need to show up on time and be present. And so we have them sign-in sheets, and then I go into the Canvas site and then automatically update. The, the, the joy of this, to some respects, is they have a mark all present. So if your class is all there, you hit that and you're done. If there are people that are absent, then you can find their names individually. In addition, Canvas has a app. Uh, it's not a great app, but one of the, it, it's a decent app. Uh, and I'm sure they're working on making it a better app. Uh, but I can utilize on my phone to access the attendance roll call. And if I'm in a class of 20 people I can, and everyone's there, I just click, I can open it up on my phone. And I often t put notes on my phone and I just press the button, the attendance is done. And then it also is automatically put into the grade book. So, and then it calculates over the quarter each day that the grades are, that the attendance is taken in there. So there's a lot of automated elements within Canvas that were not in Tripoli, which is a really huge benefit in terms of time savings and how much effort it takes to uh, manage your course. Uh, there's some other uh, useful things that are uh, more uh, buried within the, uh, the Canvas course space, uh, within the settings. Uh, as you utilize, uh, kind of build out your page, Let's say you're going to utilize the same core space uh, another year, another time. There's a way that you can click on this course link validator, and it'll go throughout your entire website and make sure that all of your links that you build in there are active, and it'll highlight which ones are not. So if you need to update or you want to adjust uh, the content, you can do that fairly easily. In addition, this is glorious to me. Uh, I teach every quarter, and I teach these classes over a couple different years, sometimes on a biannual basis. But you can actually export your course, the entire course out, and import it back in, and it will uh, align. You can align it with the dates of your course, and it'll fill in all the calendar dates based on your time, if it's a similar time, or you can make slight adjustments. It'll fill in all your content up to date for the current time, which is just a huge saving because it, it does take it does take a, a amount of time that you want to make sure you budget into your planning to set up one of these spaces, but once you do, you can reutilize the content again and again and just make some minor tweaks, uh, which is a huge savings versus, again, when I work on Triple E and I put together a page, uh, it was not as easy to cut and paste and pull it out and have as dynamic of a system as Canvas was for me. So for me, I really enjoyed it. It does have a few uh, small hiccupy things like you'll find occasionally, but again, the support team has been spectacular in terms of answering questions and being supportive in terms of figuring things out when I've made a wrong uh, adjustment. Uh, in addition, I'll say if there's a save button at the bottom, you always want to hit save before you leave the page because you can lose content very easily that way. But overall, I, I've really enjoyed it and I, I'm really excited about how the future will go with it. So without further ado, Renee. The middle, I think it's just a forward arrow. Yeah, we'll see. Yes, fingers okay. crossed. Okay, so. Nope, wrong way. There he is. So um, I have a few different classes in Canvas, and actually this was, what, two weeks ago? And so now there are like three more here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I teach both summer sessions, yay, um, and multiple classes. So um, let me tell you a little bit about why and how. Um, I am a fairly early adopter. I was not quite as early as Joel, mainly because one of my colleagues was doing it, and so I said, let her deal with it. <laughs> um, and I was busy early adopting other things at the time. So like one or two early adoptions at a time, not five. Um, so one of those people. I also tend to dive in head first. So that's just me. 
Um, the first thing actually you need to know is my classes are nothing like theirs. <laughs> I have one class that is kind of like theirs. Once a year in summer session, I teach a lecture. Um, and the rest of the time, I run labs. And I typically have 50 to 70 lab sections populated by roughly 1,000 students and 25 to 35 TAs. So just to give you, it's a very different <laughs> thing than pretty much everyone else on the campus, except for I think I've, there's three of us that have this kind of situation. So we have very different needs. And so some of the things um, you will see, you'd be like, what? <laughs> but they might apply to some of the bigger classes of three, 400. So I'll tell you which class I'm talking about as I do it. So you know whether I'm talking about the, la the lecture or the insane management of large lab classes. Um, Can I make a request? Sure. When you show us a page, uh -huh. specify whether it's what you're looking at as the manager or it's what the students are actually sure. seeing. Sure, yeah. Because that's been a problem I've had. Oh, there's also a nice thing in Canvas that I don't think any of us saw but in the settings. Um, there's a thing you can view as student. Yeah, I did find that. Okay, yeah, that's that. very helpful. I use it all mm -hmm. the time, and I wish every tool had that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially, <laughs> turn it in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really wish Turnitin had that. Um, so a couple of other things to know is why I wanted to try Canvas. Um, it was also early adoption and because I mainly existed outside of Tripoli for pretty much my entire time here. Because Tripoli is not designed for 50 to 70 lab sections with 1,000 students and 30 TAs. So it's never designed for that. And so it just didn't work for me. I used the gradebook and that was pretty much it. Um, so. I was like, yay, maybe we'll have something that I can use instead of having to cobble together other things. Uh, the other aspect of it is I use a lot of external tools. If you are managing this scale, you have to, just to survive, mm -hmm. and nothing integrated with AAA. So the hope, I had heard all these rumors that things integrated with Canvas, and so we'll, we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, so the first thing, I think, I've lost track, but I think the first thing I made was a lecture course, a summer lecture course, because, it, because I thought that would be the easiest thing to try, because it's somewhat normal. Um, I used the syllabus, and I did use files quite a bit. Um, this is a fully flipped class, so a lot of the times what I'm using for files is, here are the slides that go with the videos if you want to fill them in as you go, and also, you need to bring this to class, this is what we're going to work on. So those needed to be things that students could download and take with them, not like an image, and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, when I got to the labs, we worked on integrating outside things, and that worked good and bad. And then um, gradebook is fun when you have a 1,000 people. <laughs> and again, I stick with things focused on modules, and you'll see what that means, too. So this is, uh, I did use the syllabus for the lecture class, and this is both what I see and what they see. We would both see the same thing here. Uh, I do. This is the only time when the gradebook is simple because I do get to use normal weighted categories here. I don't get to do that with the lab class. And I embedded just the embedded syllabus in Canvas here because I thought I would try it. Um, I do continue to use it for the lecture class, although I'm going to steal the image idea. I don't use it for the lab class because it would be like 35 pages long if you just scroll infinitely because I have so much information that the lab students need that it's doesn't make sense. Okay, um, module-wise, so I have things set up as modules, not weeks. If you do a flipped class, do things as modules, not chapters or weeks, because you, if you need to rearrange them, it's much easier if they are not listed by week and you don't have to retitle everything. Um, so in any given module, so the module you're kind of seeing the end of at the top is actually, I put that one at the top intentionally. That is the thing you need to bring to class in a given week. And so I have it always at the top so that they know this is the thing to bring to class. Um, otherwise, it's broken down by module and it's, here's a section we're working on, here's the video, here's the link to the reading quiz, which is in an external tool that is not integrated at this point. And so that's kind of consistent going all the way through. They do have some assignments, like this one has an assignment connected to it. So this would show up in the calendar. Um, that's populated automatically, which is helpful when you can make that happen. I could do that with a lecture. I cannot do that with a lab. So I mentioned lots of files. Um, you can actually have tons of tons of files stored inside Canvas, and the students don't necessarily have to be able to access them all. So I had lots of things that were here well in advance that they could not see until I wanted them to see them. So that is a, a useful tool 
to have. Whereas I used to have everything in um, sites, and you can't really hide things easily there as easily <laughs> as you can here. So I did find that pretty useful. It's fun looking how many of these things have changed because this is 2015. Right. And I'm actually about to set up this class now. So we'll see how it looks this time. Um, so additional things I acquired after that one and problems I ran into, this a lot will be about the labs because that's where all the problems came in. Lecture, it was pretty straightforward. I think the only like freak out moment I had with lecture is there was some weird thing, you remember with the discussion sections and the lecture, I put it all as one Canvas space and then there was something weird with how it got set up and it wouldn't let me transfer grades because there were no grades for the discussion but there weren't supposed to be and like, it was some weird thing. We sorted it out. But of course, I was doing it you know, an hour before it was due, so we worked it out. Um, that has since been solved and is no longer a problem. All right, so when I switched to the labs, I kept modules. And there's a couple things I want to show you on this page that are really, really, really helpful. Um, first thing is you can put something you want them to see at the very beginning and do first at the top as the first module. Again, I don't do it by weeks because Students have class different days of the week, depending on when their lab is. So if somebody has class on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday, 8 a.m., 1 p.m., 6 p.m., pretty much every day of the week, sometimes even weekends. So weeks is a bad idea for me. But this is the thing you need to do before your first lab section was really a useful thing to direct them to. Do this before class starts. Note, in the first iteration, so this is this quarter, last quarter, I did not have the thing that says click here and read me first. <laughs> Actually, it just said read me first. <laughs> About 5% of the students didn't understand you clicked on it to read it. <laughs> they thought I just meant read this. <laughs> and so I added click here and read me first. <laughs> you will find all yeah. of those little things <laughs> when you do this. <laughs> I'm like, fine, I will add two words, and that solved the problem. I haven't had that problem since. All right. Um, another thing as far as, like, making sure they understand where to go and what to do, you've seen this on a couple of other, um, of all of our slides, but no one's kind of mentioned it. Notice that there's things that are black on the menu here and things that are gray. Any idea what's what? The students can see these things and click on them. They cannot see these things and click on them. I can see them, I can click on them, but they can't. One of the things I figured out pretty quickly is give them less options of, thing, of ways to navigate your material. The more ways they can navigate it, the more likely they're going to bypass this thing I set up for them all together and then go, I don't know what you're talking about because they went a completely different path. So as, more, uh, as much as you can narrow that down, it will make your life easier. And you can, you can actually have this down to like, two things if you want, or even one, <laughs> whatever your class needs. Um, I got away with this many. This was okay. Um, the other thing I wanted, well, there was something else I wanted to find out. Oh, right, integrating outside tools. So we've been slowly doing integrations, and we, our strategy has been one at a time, and let's see if this one breaks something. <laughs> and if that was okay, we'll try another one and see if that one breaks something. So we're up to two. <laughs> And we're going to talk about trying a third. <laughs> okay. So um, good and bad with the integrations, one of the integrations. So you'll see it says sapling syllabus quiz, sapling safety quiz, sapling assignment. There's sapling assignment. Sapling assignment is an online, uh, sapling learning is an online homework system that we, I use really extensively in chemistry. I, it has always existed separate from any LMS. We've got it to integrate, sort of. So it integrates now in the way that it will just transfer the total score from all of the assignments to the gradebook at the end of the quarter, which is fantastic because previously I had to remind my TAs to transfer the scores with 25 to 30 of them. Some of them follow instructions, some of them don't. So this is one less thing for the TAs to do, which is really helpful because it's a less burden on them and less of me chasing them down going, no, you're not finished. I need you to do this other thing. Uh, the part I wish it did, but it doesn't, is it doesn't integrate directly assignment by assignment. So what I ended up doing is these are actually links. So this is a little link icon. This link takes them directly to this specific assignment. They can bypass that and just go straight to sapling if they want to. Um, but I did put this in. 
as a way to guide them, this is the specific assignment you are doing here. The other thing I added, um, because I can't do due dates in a way that makes sense like everybody else does, because I have students with different date classes on different days of the week, I always have in parentheses when it's due. So for these first ones, it says the same due date for everyone, because that's the beginning of the quarter. There is enrollment chaos. People are changing sections. Just get it done. What you can't see is after this, it actually becomes rolling due dates. And then, so I don't specify a time. It says, this is due two hours before your lab section. It's on you to figure out when that is. But there's at least a reminder that it is due two hours before your lab section. So, um, I think that's it on this one. So as far as what the students see versus what I see, they would see this. And they would see the black part here, but not the gray. Um, I think they can't see that toolbar on the right, right? They see something else there? Yeah. Okay, so another integration. So this is integration number two, um, iClickers. So I have very large lab lectures once a week, sort of. Um, and there are like, you know, 400-ish people in each one. And they're only once a week, and there's no exact correlation between which lab lecture you are in and which lab you are in. So again, chaos. Um, so connecting iClicker to Canvas seemed like a good idea because that way it would just be able to send the scores in automatically and rather than me having kind of to do it outside on its own. Um, it mostly works. So a couple things to be aware of. Um, one, iClicker has a little registration issue and it's a combination of the Canvas ID for students versus iClicker's registration. So if a student is only in your class using iClickers and they are registered through Canvas, it uses their UCI Net ID, or is it their email? UCI Net ID as their, as their identification, which is fine. However, if they are in another class and that class is not integrating with Canvas and they need to register their clicker in that class, they use their ID number. And only one of these can exist in their database at a time. So we've had this issue of in, um, the identifications disappearing. And so there's kind of a workaround, but they're not paying attention to your beautiful pop-up that was the workaround. So um, it's a thing that people are aware of. Um, it's a little bit of a pain for me because of my scale. For you, if you're not dealing with a thousand students, it might be a minor irritation. It wouldn't take long to solve the problem. It's not a big deal. The other complication for me is when I sync scores, I need to sync it as one assignment for everyone. But I have students either coming on, on Monday or on Wednesday. So the students who come on Monday don't come on Wednesday, so they get a zero for Wednesday. But they got their points for the week. So I have to kind of do an aggregate score thing, which isn't that difficult, um, but it does happen. The other interesting thing here has to do with muting assignments, but I think I'm going to talk about muting assignments, so I'll bring, I'll point that out again when it comes in. Sure. Um, I use announcements extensively in both classes, but especially the labs. If you have never sent an email to a, to a thousand people, don't. Um, I do not email my class because they like to reply. <laughs> so announcements, this is the, this is the single best thing for me in Canvas. I just post announcements like, don't run in the hallways. <laughs> yes, I actually had to post that announcement. Uh, you would think that would be obvious, but I did. So I use it all the time. I try to be careful about not sending too many in any given day because I don't want to overwhelm them. Uh, so I am pretty cautious with that. You can embed videos in your announcements, which I made a welcome video and just stuck it straight into the announcement, which they actually said they liked because then they got to see who I was and. Yes, that is actually my office with the red wall. Um, the other really cool things with announcements is that you can delay their posting. So I knew this quarter, week eight, I needed this announcement to go out. I set it up on April 24th. It showed up on May 22nd. So you can delay posting, you can set a specific day, or you can even go down to day, time, like minute to the minute and decide when it's gonna go out. That's been really, really useful so that in the middle of the quarter when you're busy, you don't forget something. Um, so the grade book and the scroll of death. So grade book for a thousand people is scary. Um, we hear that it will change someday. We'll see. 
The other thing that's complicated for mine is the mute assignment or unmute assignment. So assignment, there is, you cannot mute or unmute by section if you have multiple sections in one Canvas space. It's all or nothing, which means I cannot unmute an assignment until it is, there are scores for everyone. Otherwise, I will get hundreds of emails of why I have a zero. So a lot of my assignments stay muted until the end of the quarter because I'm dependent on TAs putting in scores and that's its own issue. Uh, the other challenging thing with the mute and unmute assignments is when you transfer clicker stuff into the gradebook, it automatically creates an assignment that is not muted. So I have to watch it and as soon as it appears, click mute. <laughs> Um, and initially, the first few times I did it, I got emails from students going, ah, what is this? Why do I have a zero? And so I started posting announcements before I like, I am working on clicker scores today. Please ignore this. After about two or three rounds of that, now they just ignore it and I don't have to say that anymore. So they get used to it. It's not great, but it's not the worst. It saves me time in the sense of I don't have to manually transfer scores anymore. So I'm, I'm willing to pay that cost to not have to do it. Um, anything else in this one? This is one. Oh, the letter grade. <laughs> That's what this is. So the other fun thing with the labs is um, there's no one grading scale. I have to deal with 30 different TAs grading, and so I have to normalize grades. So there is no one grading scale. So I export all the gradebook stuff, spend like two quality days with Excel, mm. come back. <laughs> Um, and then it's like, how do I display a letter grade for the students? In Tripoli, I would just upload, I would create a new grade book that's title was letter grade only. And then I would just put a letter there. And like, this is your letter grade. If you wanna know any more, you can contact me. Can't really do that in Canvas. So what Karen and I worked out was we created a assignment or category with one assignment in it at the end of the quarter called final letter grade. It is worth all of the points for the class. <laughs> Not really, but it is. Um, and this is where I upload the final letter grades here that I have done with my quality time with Excel. Downside is this is what it looks like. Notice the number that I want to ban. I don't want the number there because then I get the contact from the student saying, but I don't understand how I got this percentage. And my response is, you didn't. Mm -hmm. Ignore it. Even though I post that announcement, um, on the assignment for final letter grade, it says in all caps, ignore any numbers you see here. And I still have to reply, no, ignore the number. It's a stupid Canvas thing, just ignore it. I think that will get better as they get more used to things like this, but hopefully maybe in the gradebook update, mythical gradebook update, we can change that. You're not really selling us on the <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me put it this way. Do you have a thousand students in 50 to 70 sections? 250. At 250, this would be a piece of cake. Yeah, if you have a thousand students, <laughs> well, I mean, for what I do with 250, yeah. this is a piece of cake. Yeah, the, the grade book is still the yeah most difficult, challenging tool. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. But Triple E grade book wasn't all that much better for me anyway. So there is no grade book in existence that does what I need it to do. Yet. I don't have high hopes for it. <laughs> I need better AI before yeah. I'm going to get that. <laughs> OK. Um, OK. That was the end of mine. Perfect. So I'd like to switch gears here just slightly and tell you, uh, talk a little bit more about a pilot that we're doing this term. Um, we were starting a Triple E Plus evaluations pilot. Um, we've got Dee Gallo here, who also does a, a significant amount of work with the self-diagnostic evaluation. She's going to share a little bit more. And then each of our panelists are going to tell a little bit about how they've used the tool this term. That's it. Okay. Well, let me ask, how many of you have used a midterm feedback tool of some kind where you want to get feedback from your students before the end of the quarter? Okay, a couple of you have. Of those of you who have, how many of you have used the form that's up on Triple E, the midterm feedback form? Okay, some of you. And how many have created your own? I just okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So some variation. I create my own too, and I created the one that's up on Triple E. So because it was created for undergrad courses, and I teach grad courses, so we needed something different. So there are two kinds of assessment that you can do. One is formative, and it's usually so that you can enhance your teaching in some way. You get feedback. You dwell on it, you decide if there's something you need to change about your class, and then maybe you change it. 
Then there's summative, and that's usually at the end of the quarter. It's sort of like the final word on your teaching that quarter. However, it can be used formatively if you teach the same class over and over. So for example, if everybody trashed the textbook, even though you have a whole new set of students, the next time you teach the course, you still might decide, I'm going to get rid of that um, textbook. So if you want to enhance your teaching, there are a couple of different ways that you can do it. Right now, the form that's up on the Triple E webpage, Triple E Canvas webpage, or even the one you create, doesn't match up with the campus wide teaching evaluation form. And one of the reasons that the one that's posted doesn't is because it was created before the end of term one was. So it's very hard for you to do a one-to-one -one correspondence. You'd need to use something that was very similar or the same. You'd probably also want to have some kind of a control group so that you could test whether or not getting midterm feedback changes anything at the end of the class. And maybe you have a class where you didn't get any type of midterm feedback. And you might want to look at the student performance in the same way. It could be grades or it could be qualitative by asking them, say, a Likert question about how they feel they've done in the class, how their learning has been. And you can use targeted questions. There are a lot of different things you can do with the actual tool. It's very challenging sometimes to write questions that elicit the kind of feedback that you're looking for that's going to help you change your teaching in some way. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this later um, and some of the ways that you can use them to best advantage. Okay, so who's next? You again? Oh, so this new, this is just how I have used uh, this new evaluations tool. Um, I have always done uh, mid-quarter feedback with the survey tool in Tripoli, um, not the official form mm -hmm. that's up there. Um, this is, you can create though your own new templates, you can create multiple templates is one of the things that's great about this. So you can have different kinds of evaluations for different types of classes um, and then reuse that template each quarter. Um, this is the mid-quarter check-in that I routinely do in undergraduate classes. Um, it asks students reflect on the first half of the class to increase your learning. What can you as a student start doing, keep doing, and stop doing? Um, so I try to encourage them to reflect on their own engagement with the course before. Second question, what can the professor start doing, keep doing, stop doing? Um, and I find this is a really nice kind of fast, quick and easy way to find out what is going well, um, especially the keep doing, what's working well, what additions would they like, do they need, are they interested in, um, and then the stop doing what's going badly. Often you get all sorts of like, so, I mean sometimes there are big things like let's read less that I can't really, <laughs> major things with syllabus less. I can't change, but oftentimes there are really little things like the lighting, I can't see the board. It's like, why didn't nobody tell me that before week five, that <laughs> the lighting doesn't work? Or when I stand in a certain position, you can't hear me. Like, but they'll say it on the form. So sometimes it's things I can immediately change. Um, this quarter, I am teaching uh, a, our undergraduate thesis writing course. Um, and so it's a very small cohort of students who are, are graduating with honors in the department. Um, I did a version of this, but only two questions. Um, what's been most helpful to you so far to support your research and writing, and then what could be done differently to better support your research and writing in the second half of the class. Um, so again, it's very quick, it's easy for students. Um, I find students sometimes feel a little surveyed out, um, so it doesn't feel like a big overwhelming thing they have to do, but it gets very quick, immediate feedback um, that I can use to adjust then the second half. Oh yeah, this is what responses would look like. Um, or no, this is how you can set the questions. So these are text responses. Um, but you could have a text response question and then a question that's uh, multiple choice. Um, the tools are very intuitive to use. Again, I am not an early adopter of things, but the minute I sat down and saw the tool, I could immediately make a survey um, with very little <coughs> copy your question. This is a trash can. Here's a little pencil to edit it. Here's the thing to move it. Um, it was all very intuitive to, to set up. 
All right, so I haven't done a, a midterm evaluation in the past, primarily because I am frustrated by the end of term evaluations, <laughs> and I notice the similarity in some respects, and I often don't have time, and then the feedback that I get often then doesn't uh, implement well in terms of the future. So I was excited about this new uh, opportunity, again, being an early adopter, to explore uh, this new framework. And I was most excited about the ability to set your own questions and framing, because again, one of my frustrations at the end of term uh, evaluation is that it, uh, within the School of the Arts, sometimes uh, being a PA and sweeping the stage is not intellectually challenging. And so you might get lower <laughs> scores on that because that's your task in this particular class. Uh, so being able to adjust that was very valuable to me. Uh, I had two classes that uh, were still, I ended up getting 100% participation. One of the things that I really appreciated about this, uh, those are not the numbers for the participation, is that uh, I set a deadline, people blow through that deadline, and I was able on the evaluation to extend that deadline so that I could keep reminding folks until we got 100% participation because I find that if you're gonna get feedback, you really wanna have feedback from everyone so you get the full scope. Otherwise, it seems like the statistics are that negative people will give you more feedback than positive people, and then that doesn't bode well for how people are evaluating you. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I was again able to exact, ask specific questions in terms of what folks were learning in terms of kind of where I was looking, where I was investing my time and looking for outcomes. Uh, I wonder if they was expanding their awareness. We had several on-site visits to SCR, to Center Theater Group, to Disneyland, like what we do in the arts. Uh, and <laughs> if that was valuable, I wanted to evaluate that because it does take a significant amount of effort to coordinate those type of uh, experiences and kind of what was the feedback. So I appreciated it, being able to ask that specific question and then get some feedback on kind of what that experience was. Uh, this is for my other class, again, just kind of highlighting specific questions in terms of kind of giving them an opportunity to ask any, and, you know, engage any additional information that they wanted me to know being a communicative tool that was uh, not specific to an individual so they could be say, able to say anything that they wanted and uh, kind of highlight some of their, their learning areas as well. Uh, I did get feedback from my students that they're a little frustrated that this actually took some more mental energy to fill this out, <laughs> which is actually, I think, extremely positive yeah. because within evaluations, people often, oh, so I circle just whatever I want or whatever thing versus actually evaluating a course. So I appreciate that as well in terms of my experience with this tool. Okay, so um, ours is a little bit different. I do a mid-quarter feedback, but it's mainly about the TAs and it didn't kind of fit well into the pilot. But we set up a thing this quarter where students could buy gloves directly from, uh, through, from a vendor through us. And we wanted to know how it went because it was our first round doing it. So we thought this would be a good way to ask that. So we did. Um, so we asked pretty straightforward questions. So it's kind of what it looked like. And again, it's easy to set up. It's a piece of cake to do. Next one. Um, so you can, as far as like the settings for when it's available and all of that, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I kind of do wish we could do a custom URL, and I'm guessing that's probably on the wish list for a lot of people. And um, that would be nice, but it's not uh, very specific. Um, as Joel mentioned, you can extend the date, but you can't do you can't do it once it's closed. So if you're going to extend your due date, you have to be monitoring it. Once that due date passes, you can't un. Close it, mm -hmm. I guess would be a better way to say it. Okay, next. Um, as far as the results, this is what ours looked like. So they're pretty straightforward um, to look at. So you have graphs, you have text responses. It was pretty good. Um, it's, we, I ended up sharing them as a PDF, so I just did print as PDF to share them. There was no obvious like download PDF like there is currently in the other tools, so that would be helpful. Um, but most of us know how to make a PDF out of a web page. So not a huge deal. Uh, the one thing I kind of wish we have, and I know it's kind of on, on the development for the future, is to be able to download as, like a CSV so we can sort like what responses go with what, like what responses in the text go with what responses in the multiple choice, um, which is something would be crucial for me when I'm using it as a mid-quarter thing with my TAs. I need to know which TA you're talking about, for example. <laughs> so which is why we did it with the gloves. But yeah, it was fine, easy to use. That's it. Good. Here I am again. Okay. So you've heard some of the problems with the midterm feedback as well as some of the benefits. Obviously, it's good to, to hear from your students. And there are some very obvious things that, that come up that you wonder, why didn't somebody just say something? Um, on the form that's up there, we do have the question, you know, whether or not you can hear the lecturer or whomever is speaking. And they often won't tell you. So it's really good to know that, of course. 
Um, the other problem, though, is even though you can point your questions in a, uh, your own form to specifically what you want feedback on, part of the problem is you've only got 10 weeks, and midterm feedback is about five weeks. Mm -hmm. And if you're trying to compare it, if you use, say, the same form that you use at the end of the quarter, they're not made to measure the same thing. So you're not going to get the same kind of data because you have not completed everything that the end of term form is supposed to capture. So how can you get the most out of this feedback? Well, it turns out that getting feedback by itself can be very useful, but it's much more useful if you have a consultation. Speaking to a colleague is very useful, but naturally, not, not just I am going to say that having a trained facilitator is going to be helpful, but the evidence in the literature also says having a trained facilitator give you feedback can really help with your teaching enhancement, especially because we're, we're uh, you know, an objective party. We're not in your department. Um, it also works better if you've got additional data that you can share, such as a videotape or having someone come in and observe your class, um, additional feedback like forms that you've asked the students or even at the end of a class maybe you just ask them about the day's uh, lesson, looking at a syllabus, looking at a lesson plan, and it's also very helpful to have a consultation before you meet for the formal one. So that would be something like, um, this is what I'm hoping is going to happen in the class that you're going to see. These are some of the challenges I've had in this class, or this is what I think is working really well, but I'd still like some feedback on it. So then the person goes into it with kind of a framework they can use for the observation. It also works better when there is some sort of a follow-up or a post-consultation. How did that work for you? Did anything change? Oh, it didn't work that way. Maybe we can tweak it, try it again. In fact, I usually suggest to people that they try something at least three times before they throw it away. Um, it also helps if you then do other things, like go to workshops or have additional consultations, or you get some resources and have additional discussions about your teaching. And what's cool about this is that you really do Get, can get better evaluations as a result. Um, this is from a meta-analysis of an awful lot of studies. These data can be very useful to you with the second piece of evidence that uh, CAP is now asking for for tenure and promotion. The consultations that we provide are free and confidential. We will come in and film your class and we don't just show up and say, guess what, we're here. You tell us when you want us to come, we will show up, we will look at the DVD, we're the only ones who see it besides you. At the end of it, we will give you the DVD. Uh, it's also very useful for your TAs. If you don't have time to observe your TAs, as long as you're going to meet with them and consult with them about their teaching, we will still do the filming for you and give you the DVD. If you want us to do the consultation, that's fine as well. The thing is we're not a videotaping service, we're a consultation service. So we rely on you to have some sort of a conversation with your TA. And of course that's really helpful when you go to write letters of recommendation as well. So everything that I just told you is up here. Um, but one of the things I really want to point out about this is it's not an evaluation, it's a conversation. What do you want to have happen in your class? What do you think is happening? Okay, let's have a conversation about that and see if there are some ideas that we can bounce around that might get you where you want, well, get your students where you want them to go. And that's how you can reach us for this service. We did it. <laughs> One minute. We did it. I was talking really fast. Me too. <laughs> um, so maybe if we have one question, we can address that. Otherwise, I'm sure the panelists will be happy to answer questions, mm -hmm. and our team will also be here as well. Yeah, it is. Good. Is there any questions on the website somewhere? We can find out how to use, how to set up uh, detailed instructions. Mm -hmm. For yes. the evaluations, yes. Yes, and it's always useful before you give them to talk to the students about why you're asking them to do it, what you're going to do with their feedback, because sometimes they think it just goes into a black hole and they figure, why should I fill this out? 
And with that, oh, I'm sorry, we run out of time before we can take more questions. <laughs> I really appreciate you all attending today. Uh, we will definitely continue to host events like this where instructors can come out and talk about their experiences, ask questions of colleagues, and, and learn more about how this program is going And I would encourage, encourage everyone to please, if you have any thoughts about this process, uh, positive, negative, don't know, just think we ought to know about it, please get in touch with us. Uh, EEE is easy to reach, EEE at uci.edu, or just call us through the OIT Health Desk, and we're really happy to talk to you. Uh, we can't do this well if we're not hearing about what you need, uh, what impediments you're facing, what's good, what's bad, because ultimately it all comes down to us trying to provide the best system and services that we can for you uh, to meet your needs. So thank you again for attending. I'll respect your time and stop right now while still technically <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs>